So uh, now we have a particular treat, a real professional chemist who's uh, in uh, leading uh, a major uh, effort in, in uh, drug development and pharmaceutical uh, advances, uh, Matai Menon. He's the global head of R&D at Jensen, uh, which is part of J&J, as, as you know. Uh, before Jensen, he was uh, uh, head of uh, research at uh, Merck. And before that, he was a local here in, uh, in Cambridge because he got his PhD with George Whitesides, who you know is legendary. And uh, with George started uh, Thurbans, which became a major successful biotech company and uh, created a lot of innovation in uh, life science and chemistry. And uh, so we, we welcome Dr. Mainan to, to speak this morning and tell us what professional drug developers do. <laughs> thank you, Phil. First, I just want to say thank you to Regina, Phil, all the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, let, me, let me begin, I think, on the other end of the, the spectrum for a moment, because I think it's uh, very important um, to remind ourselves of exactly why we do what we do. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're all very busy. There's so much new science. There are papers coming forward all the time. There are businesses forming. There are deals being done. There are all sorts, there's all sorts of activity in the world. So for me personally, when I get up in the morning and it's kind of quiet, it's very instructive to remember uh, the why. And um, you know, for me, there's a certain theoretical element that became very real. Uh, back, uh, back, Phil referred to a company Theravance that I had the opportunity to work with some time ago, start it, and, and run their R&D. Um, and there was a drug uh, called Televancin at the time that we had taken through a phase two study. Um, and there was a patient that wasn't part of that study, but uh, she was in trouble uh, with a very serious infection and that uh, the doctors basically at the Beth Israel Deaconess down the road here had more or less given up. And uh, this young woman, 24 years old, this young woman uh, was basically discharged from the hospital and sent home because there's nothing more they could do and she would probably die or she would die. Um, so before that happened, they applied for uh, compassionate use for this drug. And amazingly, like the testing was done very quickly and within 24 hours it was administered. And she walked out of that hospital completely better uh, within seven days. And then, so, but the interesting part for me, that's a wonderful story, but the interesting part for me was she came by the company uh, at the time where we submitted our, our first NDA. Um, and she brought her, and that was two and a half years later, and she brought her one and a half year old baby, Jacob. And so she introduced Jacob to all of us and said, Jacob thanks you. I thank you for uh, what you've done for, for his even existing. And so, you know, it's very, very important uh, because it's not only inspiring, because it motivates us to do what we do, but it's also, uh, uh, in a way, a guide to decision making. Because we can start companies, we can do science, we can publish papers that go in a certain direction, but the moment that direction is not headed in the, in the de with the destination of a human impact, I think we should stop and pivot. And that's just a, a reminder to, to, to me. And then since then, there have been lots and lots of instances. The company, Janssen, that I have the opportunity to run R&D at right now does all sorts of this work. And there are a slew of medicines uh, presented here that have fundamentally changed uh, millions and hundreds of millions of lives uh, by changing the practice of medicine. There are many, many first-in-class products from SGLT2 inhibitors to CD38 inhibitors. Um, many endothelial and receptor antagonists that fundamentally change how medicine is practiced to treat that particular uh, condition. Um, and then the, the company is at such a scale that we can react very quickly to problems that are of, uh, you know, of a large scale impact. The way I think about it, the reason I'm at a company, period, is the area under the curve, so to speak, of human impact that you could possibly have. Um, and if you do that, sometimes those are in commercially viable, interesting, good areas. Sometimes they're not. 
And so there's a big effort within the company to also spend energy, intellectual energy, resource against uh, 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 big problems. So here with uh, coronavirus as the most recent example, within 24 hours of the outbreak, with the, the multiple teams were able to jump right on it and go to work with uh, vaccine development and therapeutics uh, development. And that's going well, actually. It's uh, very good to see. Um, now moving to what we do um, with that as motivation, uh, you know, the process of drug discovery and development is one that's very improbable. Right, there's, there's a lot, there are a lot of projects kind of imagined. There are a lot of uh, programs put into place that attempt to find molecules and then those are developed. And as you see here, you know, on average, a lot of money is spent uh, in a probability adjusted manner on one approval at the end. Um, even after the difficulty, uh, this conference focuses on the drug discovery and, and manufacturing elements of a, of a candidate compound. But even after so much effort has gone into creating that candidate, fewer than one in 10 of them eventually become medicines because of the imperfections of our, our ability to predict what is a safe and efficacious molecule. So, you know, talks like Rick Young just gave uh, are needed and new thinking is needed to kind of reframe uh, assumptions. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. So, you know, I'll, I'll mention each one of these in a moment, but, um, you know, a different title for this slide in retrospect should have been uh, this war against bias that we actually are engaged in at the moment as we try to merge technology and life sciences. There's all sorts of stuff that happens in the imagining of a project to the discovery of a compound and its development that are based in historical biases as to why we do something X way or Y way. And so here are some examples. You know, even the generation of a particular idea, like a target or a biological pathway or a biological signature that you think has effect, uh, right now there are, there's a host of um, work that's based ultimately in validation through animal models. And the, the opportunity here is to use human systems to predict human biology. And so there's enough human data, whether it's uh, genetic or phenotypic data on human cell systems or uh, small uh, organelles and other organ, uh, synthetic organoids that you can create that are the right collection. Your human systems to predict human is a new idea, really. The other is uh, reducing the time and improving the quality of the molecule that's made. And that's much of what we'll spend some time talking about. But you know, there are there's an opportunity to sort of not be biased um, and uh, avoid these, these sort of artisan approaches uh, that, are cons that are done by craftspeople, really, into one that's highly uh, agnostic as to what's driving interesting biological activity and going with um, whatever the, the sort of the signature is that's needed to drive the, ultimately the biology you want. So, you know, in the Rick Young example, it's not screening on in vitro systems that are uh, dilute and not able to form, say, condensates in his particular example, but rather going right to a whole cell. And these days, right now, you don't need to go through those assumptions. You can go right to a whole cell and look for a panel of activity that ultimately will be better at predicting humans without falling into some hole uh, on a false assumption. On the development side, you know, there, there, here there's like a century, two, three centuries of bias. We have named all these conditions. You saw some of them on the slide that I just had up there that are named diseases, like psoriasis or Crohn's disease or whatever, whatnot. Um, and these named diseases, we try to treat with particular biological mechanisms. But of course, those named diseases that are often anatomic, they're based on our senses, like you know, we see things and feel things. Those are not necessarily the same disease. Or there may be different named diseases that are actually the same disease. So, you know, there's a reconstruction of what a condition is that you find unwanted and then therefore how to reverse it. That's extreme bias, by the way, because we tend to fall into the trap of, uh, of wanting to treat uh, a, a disease that's in some textbook. So, by the way, before I go on, I'll say that, you know, this is where um, 
I think I'm a big respecter of domain knowledge. You know, you should know what you're talking about, and you should learn your, your area really well. But you have to fall short of becoming biased by that knowledge and be able to break away from it um, when possible. And right now, with the merger of technology and life sciences, there's an opportunity to sort of go deep, but then step back and break away from the knowledge you have. Because otherwise, you do fall into these ruts. Um, saving time and costs in clinical trials. It's a big area. I won't dwell on it too much here. Huge area that uh, we, can, we can do something about. Rather than c do clinical trials by randomized control methods, maybe there's an opportunity to reach into all those interactions that all the people in the world that see physicians or the healthcare system, every time they interact with it, there's data produced. And is there enough data is the question to dip into it and pull back enough information that that can replace pieces of a clinical trial, or in some cases, uh, an entire clinical trial, if the, if the molecule's already out there and you're looking for a new application. And of course, um, enable the best manufacturing process at launch. That's actually a big deal. This is actually within, um, when I moved from more an academic setting into uh, a company setting, the most stunning underestimated uh, piece of, uh, of the work that was the manufacturing. And I think it's vastly underestimated in most uh, academic or university settings. This is where often things go wrong and the cost of goods, and it's a huge deal. Um, and then I don't need to belabor this point, but now's the time. You know, there's so much data being collected in so many ways, um, and there's so many, and, and by the way, on that, not as much, like there's lots of data being produced that's actually not stored as well. I just learned recently that all those uh, strips, those EKG rhythms that are collected on in most hospital systems for patients are just thrown in the garbage. So there's lots of data being collected that's also not stored and collected and curated and, and ordered in some particular way. But there's a lot of it. And there's obviously big advances in, in analytics and the algorithms and deep learning right now that allow us to do things to those data and get insights that were otherwise not possible. Uh, the hardware advances continue, and all of this results in this very interesting surge in investment, in especially in companies that try to merge the life sciences and technology, either coming from a technology bent and doing life sciences or the other way around. And there are very few, uh, you know, Regina used the word bilingual, but there are very few truly bilingual companies, bilingual people. Very, very few of those. They usually are biased one way or the other. So, you know, success here is, um, you know, confluence of doing multiple things really well. Uh, you know, at our company, we, we like to say that the, the one of the hardest things to do here, given that we're early in this maturation curve in the merger of life sciences and technology, is to ask exactly the right question in the right way. And a lot of time needs to be spent on that because there's a precision to the question uh, that's needed. This question needs, if answered, needs to result in high value in the way that I said right at the beginning of this talk, needs to ultimately solve a problem that heads towards uh, impacting in a positive way some patient. So the value of the question needs to be there. But equally, the feasibility of answering the question needs to be there. And that's where if you have a heavily tilted towards life science group that isn't as sophisticated on the technology, the feasibility can be misestimated. And if you have a heavily technology-oriented group, the, the sort of the biological medical value can sometimes be off too. So this is a conversation really to get both the, the value and the feasibility approximately right. And then, of course, you have to have the data. That uh, if you don't have the data, there's not, there's not really much you can do. Can you generate the data? Can you acquire the data? Can you take data from different sources and stitch it together in the right way? Um, that needs to be considered, obviously. You need the right platform to put all this into. That's uh, much harder than it might sound with uh, different data types and relating data that's of a completely different format and type from images and sound and video to genetics to uh, records that are imperfect and uh, very human in its imperfection in the medical records. You need to have special people at the end of the day. They, they're, they're, 
you know, people that I think are in, going to operate in this, uh, in this area where two big fields are crashing together need to have an open mind and need to be really smart and uh, need to have a sense really of trying things and then backtracking and trying again if things don't work out. And then, you know, things are changing so fast in this space that I think if you keep your head too down and you uh, just do your work, it's also a problem. So to be aware of what's happening in the world as uh, papers are coming out and businesses are being created and things are also going away or being invalidated, uh, an attention like that to what's happening in the world is critical. Um, you know, within Janssen, we're, we're, we pride ourselves on being very pragmatic. And uh, we've identified problems that we believe can make a big difference if solved, like, and, is, and are feasible. And um, uh, there's no way, there's dozens of problems being actively worked on right now, and there's no, there's no way to talk about all of them. But I'll give you a little, just a little sampling um, to illustrate what's happening. Just a very quick thing is in discovery, uh, whether it's uh, predicting biophysical properties of proteins, biologics, or predicting efficacy and safety of a CAR T therapy, given like the myriad variables that it needs to, to optimize. And there's very little training data for that problem actually right now. Um, using machine learning to optimize efficiency of production. I said how important manufacturing is. With small molecules e equally, there's all sorts of work. Regina will spend real time on, on showing her solutions to some very interesting problems momentarily but also using data sets connecting uh, genetic data to phenotypic human data to suggest new, new pathways for us, um, and a variety of companies really, including MIT's MLPDS, uh, that's very important to, to sort of fueling everything that's happening. On the development side, um, I won't talk too much about this, so I just want to mention here on this slide a couple examples. Um, you know, this is again, this defeat of bias is very important. So on um, bottom first, on clinical trial site selection, the way this normally works is when you want to run a clinical trial, there are a collection of key opinion leaders, typically, in the world that are known to, to have patients come to them with a disease of interest, the caveat I said before about diseases, um, and that's the center and you, you sort of branch from there. Um, in the world, that process results in maybe single digit, small single digit percent of patients that really want and willing to be in a clinical trial being able to participate because you do it this way. If you're completely agnostic to key opinion leaders and you just say, where are the patients in the world? And you use whatever mechanism you want, inference from the Google database, uh, looking at registries, looking at uh, real world data in terms of claims, where are all the patients? And you set up your clinical sites in a way that, uh, that, that goes to where the patients are. Or you, not now data science tech technology, but you go to patients that aren't near major hospitals, but create systems of video connection, blood spots to have very small sampling so that you don't need much and blood on a, on a piece of paper can be mailed. So all sorts of ways, you just have to reimagine it and get out of this rut of uh, this, this going to famous, uh, famous key opinion leaders. Similarly, on real-world data supporting, we just had a really nice example on a drug called Balversa where we were, went to FDA with a data set saying it's really great in bladder cancer, but there was another drug that was, uh, that was uh, becoming approved at the same time, and we were asked the question, what do we do? Like, how does this drug compare to the other drug? And we were able to construct a very nice data set to compare drawn from the real world using companies like Flatiron and, and others as well now uh, where we were able to pull data and simulate a clinical trial. Very hard to do, and we ourselves, uh, you know, we iterated with ourselves and then FDA a lot in order to ultimately get this over the line. So, you know, a couple examples from the discovery space. So one of the things, a major therapeutic modality within the industry is the monoclonal antibody. And um, right now, there's still lots of issues with monoclonal antibodies as they enter the clinic. They do fail for a variety of reasons. 
So here, one of the projects we're doing is we immunize um, very, I mean, a very interesting set of species, not just rodents, but there are advantages in llamas, advantages in chickens, um, and these give different kinds of antibodies with different properties. They're all, they have all got the benefit of existing in real life, like these are antibodies that actually form. So what we do is we take millions of these B cells, each of which produce an antibody, we look at thousands of clones that are selected for reasonable affinity against a target of interest, but then we look at a host of properties, and these are very important. They're uh, biophysical assays, thermal stability, uh, you know, how stable this thing is, its propensity to aggregate, uh, other, other types of properties that at the end of the day, if you get wrong, you can have a high affinity antibody, but it's not going to be a drug ever. It'll just fail. And rather than do what's typical with that training set and predict what is a better sequence in your antibody and make those, because when you do that and you go back and make the antibody, things get screwed up. There's not an ability to necessarily predict uh, carefully what the consequence of flipping out an amino acid really is. So what we do is we bulk sequence everything that's created, not just the training set, and say those exist in real life. So therefore, they're sufficiently stable. There's, they exist in real life. So what we do is use the training set. And rather than say the universe is of, uh, universe of possibilities, we go select from the, the entire sequence of things that exist in real life. And that's turned out to be uh, a good idea. And we're, we're validating that uh, at the moment. Another example here is when you have very complex biology. So this, again, Rick Young's talk was really good in inspiring this. Because sometimes you don't know what to measure. So you may as well measure the ultimate thing that you're, you don't know what to treat as a surrogate. So you may as well measure the ultimate thing. So sometimes we have antibodies that we need to get inside of a cell. So how do we predict what antibodies will get inside of a cell? There's all sorts of assays probably each of you could imagine setting up to do that. But what we're doing here is just measuring the antibody getting inside a cell and then using all the characteristics of both uh, the, antibo of the antibody to understand, uh, or we don't care what they are, but what, what antibodies ultimately are predicted to get in a cell. So here, what we've done is successfully set up an assay for in, in internalization and uh, functional activity. And we've fed that back uh, using machine learning to predict what uh, future antibodies are going to have great intracellular uptake, which is, which is amazing. Another one in the CAR T space is, I mentioned before, it's really, right now there are literally a thousand variables that you could or could, may not choose to optimize in a CAR T cell, in a construct. It's basically a giant gamish of cells, and you're in, injecting all of them back into a human after you've, uh, you've injected the vector and have them have this homing, homing protein, this CAR, on its surface. Um, but here, what we're trying to do right now is set up very functional downstream assays on human systems, again, that teach us what is an effective killing machine that we've created. And then saying we're unbiased to saying there has to be a matched CD4, CD8, or unbiased to saying there should be X percent NK cells. We don't care so long as we're training, our training uh, set is, is unbiased and we're, we're then therefore constructing the right gamish. And ultimately, you know, there will be models. Like, I don't mean to say that it's not important to have models and a mechanistic way to think. Uh, so we can't completely uncouple something phenotypic and, and uh, practical, uh, but, but empirical to the point where we don't understand. But I'm saying, like, pursue truth first and foremost with human systems, and then go work back and apply models as best we can. This is another example from the, the manufacturing realm of making protein. So, you know, there's billions of dollars a year spent on manufacturing. And uh, even small advances, in this case, what we're trying to do is double the, double the output from a cell of the amount of protein that it can make. Um, right now, there are biases in the system that talk about what you'd likely want to change. And there are certain nutrients and certain temperature things that normally you'd, you'd be fiddling with those in a design of experiment sense and to optimize a, a, a production. 
But instead, what we've created here is a virtual cell built as, as, uh, as uh, faithfully as possible based on a lot of data. And we fed into that in an unbiased way many more variables than are typically studied and have generated hypotheses of patterns that matter and then construct uh, a, a, still a large set of experiments that validate or not these hypotheses. And like that, we've managed to double uh, just by changes in the in media in ways that are kind of surprising, doubling the production efficiency of a protein. And so this is using uh, lack of bias and lots of data and the right, uh, right machine learning algorithms. So ultimately, I'll start winding down. I, I said that you know, we're, we're crashing together these major fields right now of, uh, of uh, data science and data and advanced computation with um, the, the scientific and medical domain experiences that, exist, uh, that have existed for some time. Um, neither alone is going to get us ultimately to these patients um, and, and enable life to exist uh, or life to exist in a better way. Um, right now, the, there's a paucity, a scarcity of uh, bilingual individuals. So, you know, my encouragement would be, no matter what your core training is, to go out of your way to learn this other space so that you can become as close to bilingual as you can manage, because that will serve you really well. And, you know, companies are investing in this space significantly. You know, my own company at Janssen, uh, I think it's the number one most important objective that I would have for the company is the full incorporation of data science into every element of what we do. There's many things to focus on in a company as vast as ours, but that's the one that I've decided is the most important uh, place for us to focus if we want to be long-term relevant and you know, achieve what we want ultimately for patients, like I started with. Thank you very much. If there's, if there's time, I'm happy to take a question, but otherwise uh, we can move on. Yeah, so uh, if, are there any questions, any burning questions? I have a question over here. Yeah. You mentioned a, a, a great point about building the infrastructure to collect data so that machine learning algorithms can make a, take advantage of them. Uh, what I learned is that collecting data is both a software engineering and a social engineering problem. Right? Can you, exp can you talk about some of your challenges and success in convincing your scientists that collecting data in a systematic fashion and collecting as much as you can actually will help the job in the future and not slow them down? Yeah, if you can't convince them, you just need someone different. I've also learned. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, uh, but in all seriousness, you know, the, the guy that did the work on the, the um, antibody, the B cells and the selection, is an example of a sophisticated, forward-looking thinker where um, he didn't need convincing. Matt Trupo is his name. And, um, you know, he's a phenomenal individual that right now has decided to very systematically collect large amounts of data uh, on every single, uh, every single time they create a protein. Um, I thought you were asking also a related question, which I will answer too. Sometimes data is collected, uh, you know, in the right fashion, um, but is not uh, contributed to a broader learning than the particular person's uh, lab or a particular problem. And that's also a social problem that's actually even more significant within most companies. And that, though, I feel I can take care, care, care of if it's an issue, can demand it that it be shared, and that a company, like a Johnson & Johnson, it's the company's data, not any one group's or person's data. And that's, uh, that's something that we can talk about also. But systematic data collection, you're right, and then sharing data are two social aspects that need addressing, and uh, you know, we're just getting on with it and addressing them. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so biggest impact, um, how far away are we from a fully integrated data platform for test screen? 
how does data science rank in terms of priorities? That third one, I'll say it's, there are two very big priorities. One is data science. The other is this uh, resurgence of immunology in all aspects of human disease. So those two things I would say are top priorities at Janssen. How much deep learning do you use in your company? Let me, let me take a, a couple of these. So biggest impact of AIML depends on how you measure that. Like so if you measure in terms of um, uh, a, a drug making it to patients or a dramatic savings in uh, time and, and money, then I would say th there are a couple really good development stage projects to look at. There's a post-marketing commitment that we have for one of our big immunology products that would have normally been a randomized control trial that would have cost uh, you know, over $100 million to actually conduct. But we were able to use uh, uh, real world data and constructed and right analytics in, in an unbiased way to replace that with a couple million dollar uh, study at the end. So that's a big deal. The other is um, the approval I mentioned of uh, Balversa. That drug would not be approved today if we weren't able to somehow figure out the, the, the data sets uh, tied together in the right way and how to address bias in those non-randomized data sets. And so I'd say those are two really big examples in the near term. In the longer term, a lot of work is happening right now. Hugo Kullemans, my uh, colleague from Janssen Discovery, will uh, later hopefully have an opportunity to tell you a few words about a complete upending of how we might be doing discovery. I, rather than developing a whole bunch of bespoke assays for different mechanisms, can we use images? And can we um, use images more broadly? And that's a, a beautiful uh, potential approach right now that we're, we've successfully piloted and are scaling across the organization. I'd say that's a big one, but it'll, it'll bear fruit in terms of drugs a little bit later. How much deep learning do you use in your company? So, you know, in the, in the Hugo example that I just mentioned, there will be deep learning. In some other cases, there are simpler uses of machine learning. And I want to just emphasize that, you know, a lot of the hard work is in the, in the wrangling of data and the, the finding of what data to, to actually put. So it's not the necessarily the high faluting uh, parts of what we learn as data science, but it's the everyday blocking and tackling. And if you don't do, you basically fail. And so that's a, a big part of what I want to emphasize. Thank you very much. <laughs>